Okay, let's start. There was a problem about the pigeonhole principle that a function from a finite set to itself is injective if and only if surjective. So here is a proof. Yeah. So injective implies surjective. We did that already, but we need need it also for the reverse part. So I have written the proof down. Yeah, hopefully you will take it down. And for surjective implies injective, so I am not discussing the 1 implies 2 part, for 2 implies 1. If you have a surjective function, then from the pre-image of every element in the codomain, you can always choose one element which maps to it. Yeah, that is the definition of pre-image and this such a choice defines a function. Yeah, you are making finitely many choices, so you just choose finitely many elements. And therefore, there will be a function g such that f of g of y is equal to y for every y. In other words, f g is equal to identity. Now, whenever such a thing happens, then g is injective. Yeah, the this part is injective and this part is surjective. Right? So we have seen that. So g is injective, f is surjective. So in particular, now g is injective. So by one implies two applied to g, g is also surjective. So, g is injective as well as surjective, so it is bijective and now because g is bijective, f has to be bijective. So, that is the argument. Understood? Uh, what should I repeat? What part? From the start itself. Okay. So, okay. So, if f is surjective, then we can choose one element for, uh, so for every y in A, we can, all, we can choose one x such that fx is equal to y. So, we will say that x is mapping to y, uh, sorry, y is mapping to x and this defines the function g. And that g satisfies fg is equal to 1, fg is equal to identity and therefore g is injective, f is surjective. Yeah, this you can easily prove. So, in particular, since g is injective by 1 implies 2, which is written here, we know that g is surjective. So, g is injective as well as surjective in particular, so, uh, so bijective. And therefore, since g is bijective, f also has to be bijective. If g is bijective, then you can simply multiply both sides by g inverse. Yeah, so, f g g inverse is equal to g inverse which means f is equal to g inverse. So, inverse of a bijective function is bijective. So, done. Right? So, in particular f is injective. That is what we needed. So how did you get g surjective? How did you? G is surjective because of this identity. This was one of the problems I wrote on the board. Right? So, what can, so whenever composition of two functions is a bijection, what can happen? One function can embed into a larger set and then from that larger set again we can get down to a smaller set. That is the only possibility. Try to prove this. Yeah, that is an exercise. So, uh, we have seen unions. Yes, Unions of two sets, unions of a family of sets, arbitrary unions. Yeah, We have seen all those things. However, there is also one more operation which is not really a set per se, but bijection class of sets and that is called disjoint union. So, if you have two sets A and B, how do you take their disjoint union? If A and B are sets, such that a intersection B is non-empty, then there are different notations. So, A square bracket B or A this notation B yeah, denotes their disjoint union. and is defined as the set and is defined to be 
this set. So, if A and B contain common elements, then we try to separate them into two bijective classes by doing this. So, A cross singleton 0 union B cross singleton 1. Okay, so, what we did? Something very simple. We took its cross product with two different sets. Singleton 0 and singleton 1 are two different sets and uh, respectively, I mean A cross singleton 0, B cross singleton 1. So, that even if A and B have some intersection, A cross singleton 0 and B cross singleton 1 do not have any intersection and therefore, their union will be their disjoint union automatically. Yeah, so, here can you observe that from A to A cross 0, yeah, so uh, the map in this direction which is defined by little a mapping to little a comma 0 and well a comma 0 mapping to A, this is these two are bijections clearly, right. So, I am just going to write these symbols and therefore, we are not really changing the set up to bijection. So, therefore, disjoint union is what you expect. I mean why is disjoint union interesting? Because if you want to sum their cardinalities, then what will happen? Cardinality of the disjoint union will be precisely the sum of the cardinalities, individual cardinalities. Whereas, cardinality of the union need not be, yeah, it satisfies inclusion exclusion principle. Okay. So, this particular thing is required for our purposes disjoint union and uh, our main result about two sets having same cardinality is the cantor schroeder bernstein theorem. So, let us write it down. So, for sets A and B, if F from A to B and G from B to A are injective functions, then there exists a bijective function H from A to B. So, think of it like this, yeah, if there exists an injective function from A to B, then size of A is uh, bigger, less equal size of B and also size of B is less equal size of A, then actually their sizes should be equal. equal. Yeah? So, that is what we are trying to say. However, constructing this function H is not particularly easy. Yeah? Uh, can, you, uh, can you share some ideas that you might have about this? Can you think of a way to prove this statement? Can we define this H to be F? No, we didn't say in finite. Right. So, we cannot say that either. Uh, so, F is not the answer. But sometimes f and sometimes g inverse. So, g inverse is not really a function, but g inverse is a function from image of. 
So, uh, we have, so I am not going to write the proof here, I will write proof on the next slide, but for now, so the, there are two more injective functions. First one is G inverse which is from G of B to uh, B. This is a bijection in fact, yeah G inverse is a bijection from image of G to itself and F inverse is also a function from f of a to a. So, now we have lot of data. So, let us try to picture this. Oh, by the way, yes, why are there three different names yeah, in, in this? Because Cantor gave the idea, Schroeder wrote a proof which was flawed and Bernstein corrected the proof. So, all three names are present and this is a very important result in mathematics. So, it is named after all three mathematicians. Some people call it Schroeder Bernstein, some people do not want to give the credit to uh, Schroeder because Schroeder proved it wrong. Yeah? So, so, some people just call it Cantor and Bernstein theorem, but yeah. It, let us give credit to all those great minds. So, A and B, yeah. So, the image of A is some sitting somewhere here, yeah. This is our f of A, and the image of G is sitting here. So, what is the idea? Do you want to share some thoughts? You have four functions which are injective. Uh, B is injective with uh, G of B. Right. B like is in bijection with G of B. Yes. So, like Unnono ka uh, that English. <laughs> so, that will be equal uh, number of elements. Uh -huh. And A is in bijection with F of A. So, uh -huh. the bijection, so the number of elements in both, both of them will also be same. So, how do we know that? That is precisely what we are trying to prove. You are telling me that size of G of B is less equal size of A and size of A is less equal size of F of A is equal to size of F of A and size of F of A is less equal size of B and therefore, by sandwich essentially they are the same and that is precisely the statement of the theorem. We still have not proved that, yes. Basically, I was saying like uh, if we are mapping one to one from A to B, then uh, you uh, Set B, uh, set A should be subset of uh, set A should have cardinality less than uh, set B. Don't think about cardinalities yet, yeah, because we haven't specified what cardinalities are. But again, I think your idea was around the same lines. Yes. Uh, there is an infinite descent here. Like if you map A to F of A, uh -huh. you map using G F of A to some subset of G of B. Correct. There is an infinite descent, correct? Yeah, we will use that, yes. Infinite descent or something else. So, from G of B to like we can go to F of A and then like. So, where exactly should we use this infinite descent? So, his idea is that, okay, so from A we can go to F of A, from F of A we can come back to a subset of G of B. From subset of G of B, you can again go to subset of F of A and that way we will continue with the process, yeah, which is correct. But then does it make a decision, does this procedure make a decision for all elements of A? The idea is correct, you understand? Yeah, we keep doing this, we keep making it smaller and smaller, apparently smaller, but still they are in bijection. Right. So, let us use that idea, let us formalize that idea properly. So, I always write this particular symbol, this arrow symbol to denote proof. 
Okay. So, first statement and for this precise reason I wrote down the definition of disjoint union. So, without loss of generality assume that A and B are disjoint. Okay, we do not want any trouble afterwards. If they are not disjoint, we will replace them with A cross singleton 0, B cross singleton 1. Yeah, nothing will change. The functions will still remain uh, injective. Yeah. Okay, so now for A in A, consider the sequence uh, just a moment. आपको बोला था फ्राइडे को आने के लिए फ्राइडे को कोई नहीं आया बाकी दिन सब आते हैं फ्राइडे को डेफिनेटली आना है राइट सो फॉर ईच ए इन ए कंसीडर दिस सीक्वेंस कंसीडर द सीक्वेंस ए देन व्हाट कैन आई अप्लाई टू ए ए इज इन ए एफ ओके f of a what can i apply to f of a g so g of f of a then next element f of g of f of a i have to make sure i am closing e equal number of brackets and right so this is the way this sequence will proceed however why should we stop here Maybe the sequence will also continue backwards if A itself is in the image of G then I can also consider G inverse A then if G inverse A is in the image of F then we can consider F inverse of G inverse of A and so on. So, this is potentially doubly infinite sequence on both sides we are doing this. Okay. So, there are three possibilities. For such a sequence. First one. Well, the sequence is doubly infinite. So, uh, first notice that above it is always going to be infinite, correct? A, F, A, G, F, A, F, G, F, A and you can always keep applying this. Maybe the elements will repeat, yeah, but that does not matter. The sequence will continue, right? Whereas, backwards whether it continues or not that is a question. So, the, the, there are three possibilities, the sequence is infinite, on both sides, then the sequence ends in an element of A. So, such a sequence will call A stopper. So, for example, if the A, little a that we started with, it does not belong to the image of G, then our sequence will stop here, right? Over here. The, this, these two will not be there, right? And third one, the sequence ends in an element of B and that is a B stopper sequence. See, it can obviously happen that we have one element of A. So, A maps to F of A and G of F of A is equal to A. Yeah, it is a perfect cycle. So, we keep repeating and repeating and repeating does not matter. That also falls under 1. Right? But 
there are these two different types of sequences that the sequence ends in an element of A or sequence ends in an element of B. Now we have to make different choices and this will be a piecewise choice for the function. But before we do that, first observe that every element of A lies in exactly one of these sequences. Correct? How? Hmm? There is no other choice left. What does that mean? No, we are not talking about whether it is infinite or a, a stopper or b stopper. That is not the point. We start with a. We start with? Like we are starting the sequence with a. We are starting the sequence with a, but maybe at the next step our a is this element. Yeah, I mean this could be a prime. I am I am claiming that not only well, like two elements of a, but sorry, uh, every element of A, but in fact, every element of A union B, A disjoint union B lies in exactly one of these sequences. Can you see that? If there are, so uh, let me write down the formal statement. Each element of A disjoint union B lies in exactly one such sequence. Yeah, which means these sequences actually define an equivalence relation. This is a partition of A union B. Okay. When we are talking about equivalence relations, let us first ask the question, uh, is this relation reflexive? Can A and A belong to the same sequence? Yes? A and A will lie in exactly the same spot, fine. If A and B lie in the same sequence, do B and A also lie in the same sequence? Yes? So, suppose, uh, let me use a different color, suppose this is my A and this is my B. Yeah, I mean it does not have to be from A and B respectively, capital A and capital B, but these are two elements. So, we know that these two sequences lie in the, uh, these two elements lie in the same sequence. So, I can obtain this, uh, I mean uh, I am just calling it C0 and C1, I can obtain C1 from C0 by a sequence of f's and g's or f inverse and g inverse. But since f and g are injective or f inverse and g inverse whenever we can apply them they are also injective, I can also come back from c1 to c0. Yeah, what is c0 in terms of c1? f inverse of g inverse of f inverse of, f inverse of C1. Right? So, therefore, by injectivity of f, g and the restricted functions f inverse and g inverse, this is an equivalence relation. Since f, g and appropriately defined this appropriately defined simply refers to uh, this thing, yeah, that f inverse and g inverse are functions from g b and f a respectively. Appropriately defined f inverse and g inverse are injective such sequences indeed partition A disjoint union B. Okay, so here it's uh, maybe I will say that 
prove this as homework. You will understand the use of equivalence relations better. Now again same thing if C0, C1 and C2 are three elements which lie I mean such that C0 and C1 lie in the same, uh, same sequence and C1 and C2 lie in the same sequence then looking at their position C0 can be here, C1 can be here, C2 can be here then from C0 you can go to C, C2. Yeah, if C2 is here, then you can again go to C0, come back and then C2. So basically, two elements are related if they can be obtained from each other by application of F's, G's, F inverse and G inverses. Yeah, and because all of them are injective, you can always cancel out the things which are common on both sides and continue doing this process. So this is a perfect partition. Now that it is a partition, the next defined function is actually well defined. Yeah, I mean this is a function. Define edge from A to B as little a maps to, okay. So G inverse A, if A is in a B stopper sequence. and F A otherwise. Okay, we, can, we are making a choice over here. For all B stopper sequences, what happens? The first element is in, in B. So, let us say this one. Yeah, we are in a B stopper sequence. So, therefore, what could be the bijection? If my sequence starts here, the bijection is only possible if I pull this element back here then here, then here and because it is infinite, it, it will not matter, it will always be defined. Whereas, for any other possibility, if it is two sided infinite, so uh, well, okay, let me uh, give you some new form. So, it is like and I have another color. Okay, so if I am starting, this is the end point, then what function should I choose? Like if the sequence stops, then to establish a perfect bijection between the elements of this sequence, I must choose black color, correct? Black color is a bijection, blue color is not a bijection because it leaves out this particular element. And if it is two sided infinite, then it does not matter what we choose. Yeah, Black or blue, both of them are perfect bijections between elements of this sequence, which line A on B. So, that is precisely what we have done. So, A maps to G inverse A if A is, a, is in a B stopper sequence and otherwise just F of A. Okay. Now, we, whatever function we have defined, we have to show that it is bijective. So, first we have to show it is injective. So, let us do that. Oh, let us uh, do something here. So, H is injective. So, suppose A1 and A2 belong to A and H of A1 is equal to H of A2. So, now what can happen? You tell me what can happen about A1 and A2? Can A1 be in a B stopper sequence and A2 not be in a B stopper sequence? Why? Yes, so yeah, for first note that. 
correct. So, h of a 1 and h of a 2 are the same elements, yeah, that is important since h of a 1 is equal to h of a 2, both a and a 1 and a 2, sorry, I should say either both a 1 and a 2 are in a B stopper sequence. or both a 1 and a 2 are not in a B stopper sequence. Okay. So, if they are both in a B stopper sequence, then what can we use to prove injectivity? So, uh, let me call this case uh, 1 and this is case 2. So, in case 1, h of a 1, uh, what will be h of a 1 if they are in the B stopper sequence? So, g inverse a 1 is equal to h of a 1 is equal to h of a 2 is equal to g inverse a 2 and this implies a 1 is equal to a 2 by injectivity of g inverse and in case 2 what will happen? We will always have f, yeah, f of a 1, this is our definition that h equals f on in this case is equal to f of a 2 and this implies a 1 equal to a 2 by injectivity of f. Okay, so, injectivity is proven. Now, h is surjective. This is also easy. Let b be in b. Yeah, we have to talk about b. What can happen with b? either b lies in a b stopper sequence or it does not lie in a b stopper sequence. If b lies in a b stopper sequence, it lies in a unique sequence, yeah, that is important, we are using it everywhere. If, if b lies in a b stopper sequence, then what can we say? Whose image is this? B. Obviously, G of G inverse of G inverse of G B is equal to B. Yeah. So, G inverse of G B is equal to B and then what can you say? we are in a B stopper sequence. So, if B belongs to B stopper sequence, then G B also belongs to B stopper sequence. Yes, Therefore, H of G B, yes. So, uh, yeah, since B is in B stopper, G B also is, is uh, G B also lies in a B stopper. And hence, H of G B is equal to G inverse of G B is equal to B. Correct? And on the other hand, if B does not lie in a B stopper sequence, in a B stopper sequence. So, the only elements, can you notice that the only elements which do not lie, uh, lie in B stoppers, which lie in B stopper sequences and which are at the beginning are the ones 
which are not in the image of f. Uh, let me go here. Yeah, if the sequence stops here, then this element is not in the image of f. And these are the only elements which are not in the image of f. Correct? So, therefore, if b does not lie in a b stopper sequence, then f inverse of b exists and h of f inverse of b will be defined as f of f inverse of b and that will be equal to b and this completes the proof. So, we have shown that h is both injective and surjective. Any questions about this? Yes. Which says which part? The last, thing. Uh, last two lines. This one. After H is okay. So we are starting with an element of B. Uh, we are calling it little B. Now B can lie in one of the three possibilities of sequences. Yeah, either it is in B stopper or it is in doubly infinite or it is in A stopper. If it lies in a B stopper sequence then what does that mean? What, what can you say that GB will always exist? Yeah, no matter where we are, GB always exists. But because B lies in the B stopper and GB is immediately the next element, so GB will also lie in a B stopper. So by definition of H, H of, G inver uh, H of GB is G inverse of GB, which is B. So, we have shown. Sir, how does that prove? How does that prove what? Because, uh, like, do, see, this is the element whose image under H is B. Yeah, so therefore, B lies in the image of H. Similarly, in the other case, we will consider F inverse of B f inverse of b is the element which always exists we argued that and h of f inverse of b is actually f of f inverse of b which lies uh, which is equal to b is that okay and no what's the problem okay okay you are doing this you are not this <laughs> okay uh, any other questions yes And what does it mean? These two lines, okay. So, if B does not lie in a B stopper sequence, then the sequence can be continued backwards at least one step, at least by one step. Yeah, either it could be doubly infinite or it could be an A stopper, but we can go one step back. So, what is the meaning of going one step back from B? It has to be F inverse. So, F inverse of B exists. And therefore, H of F inverse of B is equal to, right, okay. Now, I understand when you look at this proof for the first time, it is quite confusing. I am just going to erase this. Uh, but it is, uh, it will be clear when we look at this particular example, okay. So, uh, let a be equal to the interval uh, minus 1, 1. Let me and B to be interval minus 1, 1 in real numbers. Yeah, we are writing intervals in real numbers. Can you give me some injective functions from A to B and B to A? So, F, uh, let us write these things down, A and B. Give me some function from A to B. Yeah, X by 2. 
So, x mapping to x by 2 is a function from A to B and what about the other direction? X mapping to x. Yeah, so these two are our functions. Yeah, but let us call this f. Yeah, the upper one is f and the lower one is g. Okay, now what do we have to do? We have to create such sequences. Now, of course, these are not disjoint. Yeah, uh, these sets are not disjoint, but we can make them disjoint by let's say embedding inside R square. Yeah, I mean we have this plane and we are writing A over here and maybe B is written over here. Yeah, that is okay. Yeah, this is our A, this is our B. Now, whenever you embed B inside A, yeah, I mean it is it's just the identity map. What is left out? What is left out is really important. Huh? No, 0 is not left out. G is identity, yeah, whenever it is defined. So, minus 1 and plus 1 are the only two elements which are left out. And whenever you map A inside B, you are actually reducing quite a lot. Yeah, you are only taking half of the interval and then again when you iterate this process again it becomes half and half and half and eventually it will vanish. But we do not care about the eventual behavior. Now you want to define a function from A to B which is bijection. Yeah, so uh, want H from A to B which is a bijection. So, if you follow the proof of this theorem, CSB theorem, yeah, the, there will be one question of this type in, in your tutorial sheet also, like follow the proof and obtain a bijection. <laughs> what we will do is very simple actually. So, we are going to map A to A by 2 or A depending on two choices. If A is equal to plus or minus 1 over 2 to the power k for some k in natural numbers and otherwise. You follow the proof and you will get this function. Okay, what is happening? We are considering this A stopper and B stopper sequences. So, for A, if we are at these two points, yeah, these two points are problematic, but their images are these ones, which you again embed over here. Then their images will be these one, which you again embed over here. So, basically you are getting minus 1, minus half, minus 1 by 4 and that decreasing sequence. And from here also you are getting 1, 1 half, 1 by 4 and that decreasing sequence. So, you map every element in that sequence to the next element. And if an element does not lie in this sequence, then you simply keep it as it is. This is definitely going to define a bijection and this is also based on, on the fact that there is a shift operator on natural numbers. Yeah? 0 mapping to 1, 1 mapping to 2, 2 mapping to 3, yeah? n mapping to n plus 1 is a shift operator that is injective and we precisely need that because these two elements are not present in B. So, you simply follow your proof and you will get this. This you could have guessed anyway. Yeah? In general, maybe uh, in your uh, calculus course, yeah, if somebody asked you, are these two sets in bijection? You would have done the same thing. You could have chosen one sequence which contains minus 1 and 1 and any other and, and continue it indefinitely inside the interval um, minus 1 and 1. And then you just shift that sequence. Yeah, these two elements should not lie in the image. Shift the sequence and then you will get the image. This is our common thought process also. The proof actually generalizes this. 
yeah our idea can you please wake him up you should also wake up yeah there is no fan here just air conditioning so and my voice is like a lullaby right okay so by any any further questions about this this you have to do it by hand okay unless and until you actually work with this proof so i am going to give you one more question for some two dimensional subsets of real numbers and then you have to follow this idea and see what really is happening yes well i did not i am just giving you that this will be the answer yeah b stopper and a stopper you can always find yeah i mean you start with a sequence if i start with 1 yeah uh, if i start with 1 then what will be the uh, will the pre uh, inverse image exist over here under g no it doesn't so it's an a stopper okay so maybe uh, i am not using this particular definition i am using f inverse of a if a is an a stopper and the other thing yeah so uh, you can always make choice whether you want to do it for b stopper or a stopper yeah because for doubly infinite see for a stopper it must be f of a for b stopper it must be g inverse of a but for doubly infinite you have a choice it can either be f of a or g inverse of a maybe i made a different choice in this example if you actually follow the proof maybe you will get slightly different function but it it's not going to matter yeah that will still be a bijection zero will always map to zero yeah but this is a very powerful tool cantor schroder bernstein theorem is a very powerful tool for proving that two sets are actually in bijection with each other because generally finding explicit bijections is really hard yeah? so uh, let us go to another proof of the csb theorem so uh, let me state the problem first yeah so suppose phi is a monotone map from power set of x to power set of x where x is any set so it's a monotone map which means it preserves inclusions containments so whenever a is a subset of b yeah and both of them are subsets of x then phi a is also a subset of phi b that's a monotone map yes you understand definition of monotone it in, it is inclusion preserving then actually this map has a fixed point which means there exists some f which is a subset of x such that phi of f is equal to f more generally this is known as the nastatarsky theorem yeah i have also written the name what is x is x is any set suppose x is a set and phi is a monotone function yeah consider i am just going to call it y let uh, y be the family of all those subsets b subset of x such that b is contained inside phi b yeah i mean b and phi b they can be totally unrelated right b is a subset of x phi b is a subset of x and you have no no control over what could happen understood this but we are simply collecting these things now this collection may be empty it may not be empty that we don't care right we just need that this collection and uh, as both of them said yeah uh, let c be the union of y all of you remember this notation union of y what does it mean union of every element union of all the elements of y yeah so the let c be union of y and we will claim that
that c is equal to phi c. Okay, what is the first step of the proof? Whenever you want to show that two sets are equal, what do you show? C is a subset of phi c and phi c is a subset of c. Okay. So, first part, yeah. Uh, so, we will show that c is a subset of phi c. Okay. How to go about that? Show that union of phi is belongs to phi and then. Right. So, uh, let us do it element wise. Yeah. So, let c belong to c then what will happen with c where does it belong of the of yes then c belongs to some b for some b in y but but then b is a subset of phi b Correct? So, therefore, C belongs to phi B. Correct? C belongs to B. So, it belongs to the left hand side. So, it belongs to the right hand side. So, C belongs to phi B. Moreover, B is a subset of C. Correct? Because C is the union of all the elements of Y and B is just one element of Y. And therefore, by monotonicity, what can we say? Phi of B? Phi of B is a subset of phi of C. So, therefore, we have shown that C belongs to, little c belongs to phi of C. So, we have completed the proof that capital C is a subset of phi of C. Okay, what is the second part? We need to show that phi of C is a subset of C. Yeah. But what is the meaning of being a subset of C? Every element of this is there in the Yes, every element is there, but what is C? Look at C. C is the union of all y's. It belongs to y. It belongs to y, yes. It will be enough to show that phi of C belongs to Y. Yeah. yeah. So, I am saying enough to show that phi of C belongs to Y. Because y already, so c already contains union of all the elements of y. Okay, so this is enough. Uh, how will we show this you now? Come and take y <coughs> use that c is subset of phi of c. Very good. So uh, since c is a subset of phi of c, yeah, we have phi of c is a subset of phi of phi of c by monotonicity. What does that show? Therefore, phi of c belongs to y because that is precisely the definition. right? So, therefore, phi of c belongs to y and we have completed the proof. What is the condition? So, B belongs to Y if and only if B is a subset of phi B. So, phi of C is a subset of phi of phi of C. So, done? Any questions? So, we have shown both the sides. So, what is the fixed point? Union of Y or C itself. Yeah? You can do an alternate proof by considering the set of all those b's is subs uh, subset of x such that b contains phi b and then at that time in instead of taking unions you take intersection it will be a dual proof okay any any questions okay let's complete the next proof then 
suppose f and g are injective functions okay from x to y and y to x respectively yeah this is the hypothesis of cantor schroeder bernstein theorem we are trying to prove that then you define this map psi by this formula psi of a is equal to x minus g of y minus f of a you understand this definition f of a is the image image of this then y minus f of a so let us draw some pictures here so suppose this is my x this is my y then this is my a so what we are doing we are mapping a to f of a yeah a maps to f of a then you consider this region y minus f of a and then you take its image okay can you argue that this is a monotone map yes. it's easy yeah yes. it is easy to show yeah then uh, this is monotone uh, so easy if you cannot manipulate this much <laughs> then uh, like manipulate sets then there is uh, something wrong yeah you should know how to do this that this is monotone then how do we define the function h that we need from between x and y which is a bijective function so we use f of x like if x belongs to the one uh, h h yeah so now define h from x to y where should little x go to f of x if x belongs to the fixed point or g inverse of x if x belongs okay okay so uh, i i will say let f be a fixed point a fixed point okay there may, may be multiple yeah. we are just uh, saying that there is at least one let f be a fixed point of psi so x mapping to yes where should i send it to f of x if x belongs to very good and otherwise g inverse of x if x doesn't belong to f why is this function bijective okay so first of all since f is a fixed point since f is equal to psi of f we have x minus g of y minus little f of capital f is equal to f in other words yes take complements of both sides in x yeah we are using the word complement here in other words x minus f is equal to g of y minus f of f well this precisely shows since g is injective on x minus f g inverse will serve as the required function and on since f is injective f will serve as the uh, little f will serve as the function on capital f the rest is simple verification yeah so just being a a fixed point is enough so in the proof of cantor schroeder bernstein theorem that we covered in the class we explicitly construct this fixed point how i will leave it to you yeah for every function we explicitly construct this for every pair of functions because i am giving you ready made solutions so you should at least try to see how this proof and that proof interact there is one more start problem at the end yeah which says that read one more proof yeah some some of you actually came to me and showed me another proof of the csb theorem so there are multiple proofs and you should familiarize yourself with all those proofs yeah at least one more this is a second one then there will be a third one so you should everybody should know at least three proofs of this theorem any questions about this
Okay? In that case, let me just pose you the, pose this question to you. So R zero one and zero one square, I mean zero one cross zero one in bijection with each other. Are these two in bijection? One is simply an interval, yeah, bounded interval in real numbers and another one is a filled up square in real numbers. Are these two in bijection with each other? Clearly, the interval can be embedded as a side of the square, but what about the others? Hmm? we will actually prove that this is possible. Yeah? That the square and the interval have the same cardinality. They are equinumerous. Yeah? There is something called a space filling curve. Yeah? So, you start building that curve as a limit of some curves and it will fill up the entire space, entire square. Right? Okay. So, we will do this slowly and uh, all of you should revise a bit about equivalence relations. Yeah, we, uh, we know equivalence relation, we covered the definition of equivalence relations and partitions, but revise that. In the next class, we will begin uh, by defining integers, rational numbers and real numbers using equivalence relations. Yeah, because Kronecker said that natural numbers are God given and everything else is a human creation. So, we will create them and then we will start using them. Let us stop. <laughs>